weeks. Five, four. Well, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on your time zone. Uh, welcome back for the second session of the second day of Core Logistics Global Virtual. Um, as uh, those of you in the last session uh, would have heard me say, um, we're super thrilled uh, to have this focus on digital transformation, disruption, and innovation topic we've been discussing for some years now at Cool, and that was uh, amply discussed this morning. So I know this session is going to be a great addition um, to the conversation and the knowledge base uh, for the Cool Logistics chain on how we use and deploy and develop digital technologies to facilitate the flow of perishable cargoes around the world and help open up new markets indeed. And more on that later this session. So um, we have three uh, panel members with us today and speakers. And just to run through what's going to happen, uh, in a moment I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, Andre Sima um, from MSC. Absolutely thrilled he can join us. And thanks again to MSC for coming on board as a platinum sponsor and making such a big contribution to this year's event. Then we're going to hear from Genevieve Yaviel, who also, thank you for returning, has spoken at our live event um, on a fascinating project and is back to give a view on technology deployment uh, to open up new markets. Um, really looking forward to that. They both have presentations. And then at the end of the, the, their presentations, we're going to be joined by um, Anne-Sophie, formerly with Maersk. I'm sure many of you would have seen her presenting at previous events. Now with Twill, Digital Freight Forwarder, and she's going to join to give some reflections um, on her journey these last few years. And then we're going to go into a panel debate to end with some Q&A. So that's the format for this session. And um, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Andre Sima, Chief Digital and Information Officer um, at MSC, Mediterranean Shipping Company. So I've got a little bit of background I want to give you on Andre. Um, together with industry peers and stakeholders, um, he advocates that by working together, the industry can improve and simplify container shipping for end customers around the world. Just what we've been talking about these last few days. Having worked in IT since the early days of computing, Andre seen the success and growth of industries that properly embrace digital innovation and technology. Both in his role at MSC and as chairman of the Digital Container Shipping Association, DCSA, Andre strives to create a digital future of the shipping and logistics sector built around collaboration and common industry standards. His guiding principle is to use technology such as blockchain, IoT and smart containers to improve efficiency, increase visibility and drive value for shippers and end customers. One of his favorite quotes, which I also love, uh, is by Albert Einstein. If at first an idea is not insane, there is no hope for it. I'd also like to thank Andre personally. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with him at a number of events um, and online on his very active LinkedIn feed where he shares fantastic information to promote and develop the cause of digitalization. So from me, Andrew, Andre, thank you for that and uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue in the weeks, months and years to come. So without further ado, uh, Andre, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. I feel uh, I feel um, I feel very um, gives me a lot of strength to, to hear your positive words. Um, what I did is um, we, we made a video, especially for the for the audience of Cool Logistics, a bit of a different uh, different scenario. But at least I can get the messages across without making very long sentences that in the end nobody understands. So I think uh, I just want to thank you, Rachel, before even before we start, and the organizers for. Uh, all the hard work you're putting in, um, and I'm happy to contribute to this to this very valuable event. So, 
please, please go ahead. This morning, out of the blue, my colleague Patrick walks into my office with an avocado in his hand. And he says, I just bought it, but the problem is I can't eat it, it's rock hard. Now, if I let it sit for a couple of days, it might ripen, but it might go brown. You never know. Sounds familiar? Now put yourself in the shoes of our end customer. How do you think they feel? In the next 15 minutes or so, let me take you on a journey on how we can continue to feed the world together in a smarter and fairer manner. I'd like to address three challenges. Volumes, changing the game, and it's not just about containers. The container has revolutionized shipping, and we haven't stopped with innovations such as bigger and more efficient ships, faster turnaround, and the use of technology for better monitoring and traceability. And still, nearly one-third of all the food produced globally is lost or goes to waste. So we've achieved a lot, but when you're talking about 1.6 billion tons of wasted food every year, what does it mean financially? Well, I'll tell you. It's $1.5 trillion completely gone, and of course shipping is just one part of it. As an industry, we have two options. Each of us can go about it on our own, or we do it together. If we do it on our own, we will all invest substantial amounts of money and people, and in the end, our customers will not reap the benefits from interoperability. If we do it together, we can share some of the costs and research and ensure we give our customers a solution which actually works. We must never forget that digitalization is only one part of transforming our industry. The challenge is enormous. There is a way forward, and here's the first call I want to make. We move the world, so let's be smart about it together. Last Friday, I posted a question on LinkedIn. What digital transformation mistakes should we avoid? And within one hour, I got over 20 comments. And one of the comments from a large carrier said, if we truly care for our customers, we should look beyond our own little turf. Absolutely. And we acknowledge that it may be difficult for some to invest in digitalization. However, only mass adoption will make it accessible to everyone. Now, what we're doing at MSC is not very different from what our industry peers are doing. However, our goal is to share to be interoperable together. It's not about replacing people with digital technology or competing with other carriers, but it's about meeting future demand as we become 10 billion by 2050. In 1980, we were 4 billion humans, and we shipped 3 billion tons. 40 years later, today, we've doubled our population to 8 billion and multiplied by four times the cargo to 11 billion tons. By 2030, we're going to have to find a way to ship another 5 billion tons. But we don't have 40 years to get there, and the revolution of bigger ships and the container has already happened. We recognize this need of meeting the growing volumes of the industry. When we spoke to our customers from different sectors, they all confirmed that they want to be in control of what is being monitored and how exceptions are being dealt with. Needless to say, they want reactivity, traceability, and the inclusion of an encrypted private communication channel. To this end, we've launched a series of pilot projects, which are in progress as we speak. Now, with the permission of the non-techies in the audience, allow me two minutes to satisfy those who are more digitally inclined. We've been offering smart dry containers for some time with measurable success, and we're now targeting mass adoption. And we're doing the same with reefers, although it's a slightly more complex challenge. Here we need bidirectional communication, connectivity to additional sensors, and the ability to communicate on land and at sea. To run select pilots and learn what gives our customers the best value and experience for their money, we've already made 15% of our reefers smart. To enable communication on board, we've already equipped over 70 vessels, and connected over 16,000 reefers. The MSC objective is to prove that a modular, scalable, and open IoT architecture is the one to go for. This will allow interoperability between MSC and other ocean carriers, 
reefer container operators in a very flexible way. For instance, by enabling the onboard roaming, containers on board any equipped vessel can report back to their respective backends. This allows seamless remote monitoring when at sea, as well as for local monitoring purposes by the vessel crew. Unlike what most people think, the first people to benefit from the solution will be crew members. They will no longer have to be exposed to the elements to verify the readings of a container or to make adjustments. After that, the smart customer will benefit from improved monitoring and increased reactivity. From a technology point of view, the future standards will allow them to customize the final configuration. And only once we get the economies of scale will a shipping company such as MSC benefit. Even more reason for us to do this together with speed. The industry needs more business cases and pilots. And although we have a limited number of resources, if you have a vital endeavor, please do talk to us. And what I'm trying to say, critical to our success, is you. We fundamentally believe that a collaborative effort towards establishing new standards has to become the norm. This is what we see as a game changer to lead to a more digitally advanced industry as a whole. And that's the step we need to take together to challenge traditional business modules and drive the entire supply chain towards a new era of connectivity, transparency, and efficiency. Let me give you an example. If you're shipping a smart container from South America to Europe, you may be using different carriers. Only if these carriers have implemented a compatible communication solution on board can the customer have an uninterrupted service and not go blind at any point. Personally, I believe in a win-win-win solution by sharing a unified digital ecosystem, one that is defined by all of us working together. A concrete example is the creation in 2019 of the Digital Container Shipping Association, DCSA, a neutral, non-profit association driving standardization, digitalization, and interoperability in container shipping. Initially conceived as a carrier-driven initiative, today we want everybody to have a say. Why? Because standards require that everybody is on board. Besides the founding members, Maersk, CMAC, GM, Hapag, Lloyd, ONE, and of course MSC, we now have Evergreen, Yangming, HMM, and Zim, and we really hope other carriers will join soon. Since its inception, we have been really busy. We've already delivered five important standards. One, the industry blueprint, which is the basis for processes, milestones, and messages for the container journey. Two, track and trace open APIs to achieve alignment and multi-carrier tracking. Three, IoT connectivity, which allows interoperability between smart containers at the radio interface level. Four, operational vessel schedules to enable automatic sharing of vessel scheduled data between carriers and operational service providers. Five, load lists and bay plans to enable communication of container load volumes and storage details between VSA partners, terminals and ports. And ultimately, this allows for optimization of storage, load and discharge processes. And soon, number six, e-bill of lading. So watch this space. So my second call for this audience is visit dcsa.org. Give us your feedback and ultimately adopt the standards. Which leads me to my last message of today. It does not stop at containers. To ensure that as much shelf life is passed on as possible, each link in the cold chain depends on the best practices all along the supply chain. And to embrace the full potential of IoT, we need to look at the entire journey from the end client perspective. And if we want this to work, it's more than just what's happening inside the container. We need to know what goes on in the truck, in the port, in the customs house, on the train, in the warehouse, and ideally even in the shopping bag. And this is why we need to get you and all of you on board. We're in this game together. Now is the time to agree on the rules. So back to the avocado. Avocados travel a long way before you give them that squeeze in the supermarket to test their ripeness. The likelihood is that this avocado was picked two months ago. It was weighed, washed, locked up, chilled, put in the ripening chambers. If we did things differently, 
Maybe we could ship tastier fruit and one that isn't rock hard or brown on the inside when we buy it at the supermarket. So I'm no expert on avocados and I don't know all the answers, but collectively, I'm sure we do. Now to sum up, I'm asking you three things. One, we move the world, so let's be smart about it together. Two, visit DCSA.org and help us with the mass adoption of standards. And three, as an industry, we need more business cases and pilots, so we'd really like to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre, uh, for that inspiring video, touching on so many themes that we've been discussing these past few years at Cool Logistics, the digital transformation of the industry. So I think now we are going to have a uh, chance for some uh, follow-up Q&A with you before we move to hear from Genevieve. Uh, but I think we know from our uh, speaker briefing earlier, Andre, that a uh, presentation from Genevieve is going to really complement uh, the message that you've just sent out. So um, I wanted to open up, um, if you don't mind me taking moderator's privilege, uh, with a, a sort of a more personal question, actually, uh, based on the conversation we had yesterday. Um, with many of the speakers in the session. One of the things we spent time talking about and you referred to in your video is that digitalization is accelerating. There are new people coming into the industry like your good self from an IT technology background, uh, but there's many people in the sector who bring hard-won operational on-the-ground experience. And the question I guess I have is for you as a leader in a major shipping enterprise. What do you see as the keys to marry those two worlds for mutual benefit um, and to speak, as we heard yesterday, learn how to speak a common language or at least be able to translate um, the uh, expectations of each side and the priorities of each side? Well, thank you. That's a, that's a good question, Rachel. By the way, the avocado is still not ripe, so we'll have to <laughs> discuss that. Uh, well, I I think, you know, having I mean, having initially starting my career as, as in in um, developing applications, uh, speaking to users, trying to understand what people you know actually need, not always what they want. Um, it's it's always been quite difficult to get IT aligned with the, with the business. So one of the um, one of our main focuses in the past a couple of years is really to get the business on board. And to do that, what I've tried to do is to attract more people coming from the business into our sort of, you know, innovation teams or digital teams, as, as you want to call them, to, um, to really help bridge that gap. So I think that, um, you know, leaving the pure IT um, stuff aside, which of course is, you know, necessary, we, we don't have a choice. But I think trying to get much more input from the business, spending a lot of time explaining uh, also, you know, um, what we do in a more, in an easier to understand way. And I think that we're seeing, obviously, we're, we're not going to talk about millennials because that's an old story, although they're young. But it's also about bringing, you know, a bit of, a bit of the younger generation and they themselves bring that uh, change, I think, to, 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 to the way we see things. So. Um, it's definitely collaboration once again. So just to follow up on that, Andre, and um, I know we, we spoke about this on another webinar uh, a, a while ago. You know, what are the challenges you know, within a large established enterprise like MSC you know, of sort of transforming from within? Um, how much does the cultural aspect uh, matter uh, versus uh, other elements of running a business? 
Oh, that's a psychologist. Uh, um, <laughs> um, you know, and what do you think about it? No, that's, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's about, I think, demonstrating to, to our teams, to our colleagues, that um, we're, we're looking at, um, we have a more of a customer centricity, I think. <clears throat> you know, in large companies, you tend to think that, oh, you have this great product, um, I was, my phone's a bit far away, but, uh, and you know, it's going to sell. Okay, that works to a certain extent, but I think that if we look at the way uh, the world is developing, if we look at the kind of people that we bring on, on board, and if we want also to interest people into, into joining this industry, then we have to be a little, we have to think a little bit differently. And from my, my personal experience, um, it's speaking to customers at the right level, of course, that I learn the most as to, um, you know, apart from obviously our core business, which is transportation, what else is it that, uh, that we could do to, to, to help them? And I think that's, that's given us a lot of leads. So another question here, um, I know you've been um, instrumental in um, spearheading DCSA, and getting it off the ground. Um, and it seems that DCSA has been able to move pretty quickly and coming out with standards. Could you speak a little bit more about you know, the work of the organization um, and um, you know, what the next steps are likely to be? Absolutely. Well, you know, we, we created the association with the, with the four, uh, four other carriers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, nobody wanted to be chairman, so I said, OK, I'll do it. Um, but I think that the, the reason why this is, is so interesting to me is there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is that we, we realize, and I think we all realize, between you know, CIOs and IT guys, we talk to each other. So there's no competition between us, whether you're a, another shipping line or, or even another industry. And, and we all have this, sort of the same issues. Um, and if I look at um, what we've been doing in the past 20 or 30 years, connecting people, and we started you know, 20 years ago with Intra, um, it, it was very complicated because nobody was employing the same terminology. Uh, everybody had their own codes. And so the fact that we were you know, mapping all these bits and pieces of data, we were actually losing the, the value. So I think part of the, the, the idea behind Intra was to standardize, and we did on, on certain elements. But we needed to go much further. And then, of course, we needed to address also uh, the technology side of things. Um, and the, the great thing about DCSA is that we, you know, obviously we have a, we're a non-profit, but we have a budget, we need to operate. Um, but the list, the to-do list, just keeps on expanding because all of these other companies are coming to us and saying, well, you know, why don't you help us here? Why don't you help us there? Um, and, you know, we could re we, we're really trying to bring value through agreeing on standards um, and then, of course, ensuring that they're adopted. That's the difficult part. Uh, it's easy to publish them. It's a lot of work. Um, the teams work very hard, even during the, the, the pandemic. But I think the, the key element for me is getting them adopted and, and coming on board. And that's probably the difficult part. And what do you think the main barriers would be to uh, that adoption curve, uh, Andre, from, uh, from your experience? Well, I think uh, quite simply, we, we, when I say we, I mean the carrier world, but also um, the other companies that are you know, evolving in, in, in the sector need to bring a little more value. Um, and you know, if you bring value to, to, to someone, they are, they're ready to change. If you bring the same thing in a different color, nobody's interested because you know, it works, why would, I, why would I change it? So I think that we need to demonstrate that we can bring value um, by, uh, by adopting the standards uh, and by promoting them. And um, just before we move on, because we have chance to come back at the end of the session and talk all together, which I think will be a really very interesting. Um, you spoke about the uh, MSC uh, journey for smart containers, having started with dry containers and now um, into the uh, reefer um, uh, universe. Um, and I think later on we want to talk a bit more about real-time information and how that gets shared. But I'd quite like to do that maybe together with Genevieve for a mixed perspective. So you said around 15% of your reefer fleets equipped at the moment. Uh, you know, in practical terms, 
what do you expect as the trajectory for you know bringing the rest of a large reefer fleet on board? Well, obviously, I mean, <clears throat> my goal, and with the permission of our of our head of logistics, who, who's not sitting next to me, so but he may be watching. Um, you know, my goal is obviously to to equip um, all the all the containers and as many ships as, as necessary to to enable that communication on board. Um, the I think will bring value um, to our customers, but also to ourselves, only with critical mass. So um, I'm not, to be very honest, I'm not a, a reefer cargo expert, but I think that we need to reach um, at least you know 60, 70 percent of the fleet um, on the on the reefer side, and possibly on the dry side later on to to make that worthwhile. Otherwise, it's going to be probably too complex from a uh, logistics point of view. And uh, finally, aside from the IoT, you mentioned other technologies. What else has got your uh, attention and focus um, in addition to the to the smart container component at the moment? Well, I, I think that the, the smart container is is already something very interesting because there's there's many ways to obviously to use the data for for all sorts of purposes, and maybe we can discuss that afterwards. But um, we're also looking at uh, you know the the usual culprits uh, AI ML robotics. I'm not so keen on, but you know I guess it's it's fashionable. And of course, the blockchain, which I haven't mentioned yet, so uh, mm -hmm. now I get to have a drink. Um, <laughs> but you see, the thing is, all these technologies make sense if if you have um, if you can bring value by using them. So I tend not to look at technology and say what can I do with that, but I rather tend to look at the you know the problem is to say you know what technology can we use to, to resolve that and I think once again I know it sounds like a, like a, a broken record um, but we need to get those standards sorted out otherwise we're never going to be able to to share information in a way that um, that makes sense to, to the end user of that of that data it will be difficult to connect the dots and gain the critical mass that the end user can uh, benefit from ultimately Yes, absolutely. Because you know, looking at uh, a lot of customers are multi-carrier. So if they're multi-carrier, they don't want to have a different method and a different uh, interpretation of the data for each of their of their partners. So I think that's that's where the you know the standard story comes in. Yeah, this has certainly been something we've discussed the last few years. And as you say, with the alliance, shipping alliance, world and multi-carriers, uh, reefers from many different uh, carriers on board a single floating vessel um, finding a way to align that um, for the benefit of the end user is uh, pretty important um, well I have many more questions um, but if you will permit me Andre I'm going to say thank you for now and just to let the audience know uh, because we did have a few issues on the technicalities of um, presentation sites earlier. Um, Andre's going to be staying here and coming back later, but he's just going to be muting himself and going off camera um, whilst we uh, welcome Genevieve to give uh, her presentation. Thank you again, Andre, and look forward to seeing you later in the session. Good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening to all. Uh, I am so happy to be back uh, with you guys. And uh, thank you, Rachel and team, for having me. And Andre, thank you for the lead. And just so everybody knows, we did not collaborate. We didn't know we were going to talk about it. I think the port of Rotterdam might be the culprit, because last year they gave us avocados, so we all had avocados in the mind. So I'm Jean-Vierre Lavelle and I am the CEO of AgriLedger and for the last year, so last year in September I came back, I came to see you guys in Barcelona and I had just traveled from um, Haiti uh, recently to be able to look at setting up the system and I'm glad to report um, that we have started and I'm going to take you through a little journey with me. Let's see, uh, I think I'm having... So, Haiti. This is Haiti. Um, many of you might have heard of Haiti more in terms of um, the hurricanes and the uh, earthquakes that have happened. So, in 2010, there was a huge earthquake, which really destabilized the country. But 
uh, because of all the issues that have been going on in Haiti just since before that, many may not be aware of the beauty of Haiti. And the only taste they might have is if you take um, a cruise with uh, Royal Caribbean and you end up on the edge of Haiti, but you don't really get to come into uh, what is Haiti. It was discovered in 1492 by Christopher Columbus. And that was because they were trying to get to India, but somehow they didn't navigate properly. So he found instead Haiti. Uh, in terms of history, Haiti uh, was the first black nation to, uh, and only black nation to actually gain her independence through the use of force uh, in 1796. So only 20 years thereafter, the US um, had done their uh, breakup from the UK, uh, from, the, from Britain, sorry. And uh, Haiti as such was really scared of being uh, invaded. So you will find in Haiti, not only lush lands, but also great uh, structures such as this, which have, somehow going to disrepair but still the engineering was amazing if you also imagine that in 1796 first black nation um used to have 40 percent of the gdp of um of france and was the largest exporter of sugar for sugar cane and coffee and chocolate which at the time were all the rage in europe so now you can't get your shipping to the Atlanta, to Savannah anymore. And from Savannah would have been where you put in a big ship to send over to the US, uh, sorry, to Britain or France. France also slapped Haiti with a $40 million uh, valued at that time, fine for getting their independence. So very much lots of history. However, Haiti today, um, it's always around trade, isn't it? Because when in the 1980s, 90s, Venezuela was flush with cash, what she did was to get her neighbors to sort of uh, side with her by giving them gas with a 30% discount, which was repayable at some point. But that repayable was uh, when they would knock in. And as we all know, uh, Venezuela has been suffering of late and has been knocking. So in 2018, the people of Haiti found out that there were millions of dollars that had come in, uh, which they paid for the gas, but the money should have been paid back to Venezuela, but never made it. And that created what was called pay lock. So we've had the world on lockdown. Haiti has been on lockdown way before that. Since November 2018, they've been going in and out of lockdown. So um, first was from November to February. Then it reopened. Then they went, they had in and out in June. Finally in September. So September 2019 until uh, January was complete lockdown. You could not move. You had to do a logistical nightmare in being able to have things delivered because you never knew if the road was blocked. Which brings us to this whole issue of the economic reality of Haiti. So Haiti subsides quite a bit on aid money or remittance. So about 30% of the GDP is based on remittance. As you can imagine, uh, IMF has been, and the World Bank have been saying that the remittance did not suffer as much as they expected with COVID. But I actually wonder if that is going to be the case if we have a second lockdown where people who may have actually dipped from their savings to be, in order to be able to help those back home. This is what is used for everything from education to food for, by the local. And if that is, if they don't have their job, what will really happen to Haiti as a result? So um, Andre spoke a little bit and said he needed a drink. Actually, maybe that's my problem, Andre. I've run out of rum, <laughs> and so no more drinks for me. But about what is being blockchain or these two blockchain is the first successful use case 
of distributed ledger technology. And very much like we call Kleenex for tissue paper, that is the name that is sticking. But we need to think about how we develop that and what are the problems, the, the opportunity. And one of the things that I want to speak about is instead of just concentrating ourselves on the supply chain, it's really about the value chain. So I actually do not believe that the supply chain is broken or has problem. However, interoperability is an issue and understanding the value extraction is what is key. So there are a number of high impact uh, cases. So uh, everyone is getting to learn supply chain. Um, obviously, I think it's related. If we think about the Bitcoin, it was the supply chain and value chain of money. So now if we look at the overall supply chain, some of the work that has been done by Trade Lens is very much about how do we unify, how do we create data sharing, and how do we create better straight through processing. And in my view, the a great place to do this is really in the oldest of all supply chain, which is agriculture. So uh, we started um, in earnest in last May, 2019, uh, with uh, a project that was sponsored by the World Bank. It's uh, a DAI, so uh, uh, development aid uh, initiative looking at how to address the bottom 40% of poverty in Haiti. And this was done with the Ministry of Commerce and Industry in Haiti. So I just want to bring this just so we can all be on the same page. There are current challenges in agriculture. Uh, and I like word challenge because those, those are things that we can address. And they are at the level of both the customer, the producer, and those of us who work in the space. So obviously, lack of liquidity and financial inclusion are very big issues for the producers. And if they don't have liquidity, they don't have working capital, they cannot produce the best that there is. Also, information is an issue. And food safety becomes an, an issue for us as customers because we don't know where it came from. We don't know how long it's been there. Um, Andrew was talking about that avocado, which is two months old, and that's why we get it brown. So we would like to know when it get, gets there to us. And that's the trust issue. And finally, the food waste, because if I get the avocado and I, it's brown, I'm going to put it in the dumpster right away because I can't eat it. So how do we reduce this and how do we work with our customers toward that? Now, um, value, you know, this is a simple way of looking at a value chain. So if we're looking from the producer to farmer, you can have what is a local market and looking at now starting being able to have order management being done at the local. But if an item is going through the international market, there are many different places that it needs to hit from everything from transportation in country to transportation in a receiving country. And through that whole value chain, all the way to the customer and the retailer, how can you then look to mitigate this? So this is the project in Haiti. This is actually a little boy that I saw in June. Uh, he was harvesting, June 2019, he was harvesting uh, mangoes at the time. And it was probably about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So he should have been in school. And I hope that what we're doing will help him be in school and then help him also manage because those mangoes by the time they get to us they're probably bruised this is going down the mountain and then even though they look beautiful they won't be so beautiful when we cut into them so just as a quick question um do you know what percentage of a farmer is earning for a mango which is sold in the u.s at three dollars and for those who live in the u.s you will know that you'd be lucky if you got that mango at three dollars because the Madame Francis, I've seen it at the supermarket at Poissel, two for five, and that's when it's at the end of the season, which actually in the season when there's so much of it. But you can also pay five dollars for one. So two percent is what is the current without the um, blockchain solution put in there. Now, 
just imagine a world where it takes only a second to know how much of what you paid has gone to a producer. And that is what we are doing right now with the support of the World Bank and the Haitian government. So we had a mango run in Haiti in 2020, and we it actually went live on May 1st, which I love because that's the day of work. And what we found would, were about eight weeks, there were six runs, 38,000 kg of mango were harvested. We also know that 23,000 of those actually made it to the foreign market because there was waste. We, um, there was a loss at the farm gate, the farmer bought in things which weren't befitting, so they were rejected. Then also you had a certain level of rejection and unfortunately also some errors throughout the uh, pack house, which meant that only 23,000 get sold. The amount that was netted was 40,000 for that 23,000. With the farmer receiving, I will tell you in a minute how much, but it was an uplift of 7.5, so 750% of the available uh, price on the market. So the new earning was 68% going to the farmer and 32% going to service provider. To me, it was actually. Uh, shocking. I had expected them to be at 32%, not the other way around, but this is absolutely beautiful. As a result, uh, this is where I was saying that we didn't plan this, but uh, the Haitian government and the World Bank have put together in September, they put in a tender where they have six new logistics companies, which will be providing the harvest from the avocado, all the way to the foreign market. And the idea with this is you can go from the tree, the guy picking it up from the tree, the farmer will receive messages and they are text messages. And for those of you who don't speak Creole, this is telling him when he should be coming in for the collection, how much, so the 600 avocados have been taken from him. And also that they have arrived in the US and that they were sold at X price per kg. The final message that he will receive is how much has been deposited into his bank account or into his mobile account or the cash that he should be coming to pick up. Now, every fruit will have a QR code that is put onto to the fruit so you can get that whole journey. And I'll show you a little bit how it looks. And then finally, also bringing in this whole idea of what are the recipes that a customer might want to have because obviously when I have that fruit, I, it's like the chicken. How am I going to make the chicken today? So this is really about creating that knowledge. Now this is the screens that we have designed thus far. So you can actually see the avocado, get your nutritional value, understand the caloric intake. Who was your farmer? Where was it done? Uh, what's the temperature? How long did it take to come to you? And finally, again, the recipes. So um, now one of the things that we are doing is we're actually looking at expanding this from fresh fruits. So could you please, please play the video? And I hope some of you get to dance a little with us. Jerusalem, I call on me.
Thank you. So um, as a result of the pandemic, I was stuck at home, maybe thinking a little too much. <laughs> we came up with a new, um, actually, I don't think it's new because I actually was talking about in that in January, the whole fast moving customer good. How do we get certain? And when we talk about fast moving customer good, we should remember that food is actually part of that. So if I think uh, fresh meat, fresh fish, how do I know that it is frozen at the right level? So being able to, from the manufacturer, be able to tell this is where it came from, this is what has happened, the processes that have happened, a crypto ceiling, and also being able to use custom um, system, which are already available in the market, to then be able to bring in that smart logistics. So that's why, you know what, after this, I'm calling Andre because I want to be part of that group because we have a challenge. How do I, because if we looked at what was happening at the beginning and continue to happen, because actually last week there was a uh, something about in Guernsey, how they had to reject 25,000 flu shots because the temperature was not kept properly. And as such, that means that there is, they had to now ration it for those members of society which are most, most affected. Now, if the person is getting it, but I don't get it and I'm the one who's sick, think about all those things. So what we have designed is actually a system using simple IoT, using what is there, putting in on the blockchain to create that trust and then being able to show, because we talk about drug uh, fraud, the fundamental is not just that I can go to the manufacturer and check that the drug is real, but how do I make sure that if it's been used, it's not double use? So this is the concept that we're going with. So now this really belongs in the idea of smart packaging. So future, what we're concentrating right now is the rapid 15 minute test. I don't know about you. I really, that whole thing of waiting for days, I just want to know right now and then give me a, a pass to go. And so that will be, and also the supply of COVID tests uh, test that and also the vaccines that are coming is what we're looking at being able to do and it's a simple process in my point of view this really is about the chain of custody this is about data being shared and understanding where everything has been and i think that there are further uh, benefits that we can all extract from this which is how much time do we waste with insurance proving that something has happened so if we now can have immutable data, which means data which is not cannot be tempered, you can then see a system whereby we reduce the amount of time and wasted time and cost that we have to do to get things affected. So my vision is actually a mango, an avocado comes from Haiti. There's a problem with the reefer. It's not the fault per se of, you know, things happen, but then we can trust that it has the right thing has happened. So thank you very much. And if you want to contact me, uh, you can do so through our website or through our email, which is at hello at iagreledger.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Genevieve, for a fantastic, uh, very thought provoking presentation. And great to have a little bit of music in the middle. Hopefully people might have been dancing around. Uh, the team here says we've been sitting still in our chairs for quite some hours these last few days. So thank you very much for that. Gosh, such a lot of takeaways from that. Um, the word that I got most though was trust. Um, so we can come back to that. But what we want to do now is uh, hopefully be rejoined by Andre because there's such a lot of parallels from uh, his speech and what you were talking about. So I'm excited for the debate. First of all, though, we wanted to welcome Anne-Sophie uh, back. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been some years since uh, you first stood on the stage at Cool Logistics uh, to talk about uh, Maersk's remote container management journey uh, as part of digitalization. <laughs> You're in a new role now. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to turn the floor to you to give some remarks on your personal journey these last few years, um, what you've heard from the speakers today, and uh, what Twill's trying to 
uh, do and accomplish in the in the business yeah um thank you so much so thank you so much for having me uh, again it's uh, always a great pleasure to uh, to be joining cool logistics uh, even if it is uh, virtual so uh, to everyone so my name is uh, Anne Sophie um, and I am the lucky girl who today is the CEO of the corporate digital startup that's called Twill uh, which is uh, owned uh, fully by uh, by Maersk um, but the, the reason uh, I think I am uh, uh, being invited uh, back is because uh, I, over the last years, uh, in my previous job where I uh, was heading up the reefer business across the Merck brands, um, had the, the, the great pleasure to, um, to be joining this conference and engaging in a lot of very, I, I always thought, fruitful and interesting conversations. Um, around our industry, um, very much uh, for me, always with a focus on the digital transformation that is needed. Um, and my heart has always been beating for an industry that I firmly believe needs to um, return to having a much larger focus on customers and uh, actually delivering value for uh, for these customers and an industry that needs to get closer together in terms of uh, vertical collaboration um, with each other uh, as well as uh, some of the many new digital players in the industry so i just i have to say uh, before i start andre uh, your uh, your presentation was uh, was very exciting for me i have to say that uh, your messages were like music to my ears so um, so thank you so much it's uh, it's really wonderful to hear and super exciting the the initiatives that you're working on in MSC as well. Um, so so in Twill, you can say I think probably because uh, I have always been uh, also internally in Merck been talking about the digital transformation and so on, and as well as this customer experience that I want us to get back to focusing on. I have been giving this task uh, or opportunity to actually try to create a value proposition for the smallest customers in the market. That is a purely digital uh, value proposition and where we try to kind of get rid of some of the old uh, legacy systems that I think most of, especially the shipping industry is, uh, is uh, uh, carrying with us and trying to build something new that um, and that is really bringing together deep expertise from logistics with uh, new capabilities uh, from the digital sphere. Um, and one of the things we are trying to do in Twill is to try to, you can say, rethink logistics a little bit. So try to um, learn from the B2C uh, digital value propositions that we know from other industries in terms of uh, both how uh, how they do uh, everything from contracting to revenue models um, to um, to also customer service, rethinking customer service. I'm a very big believer uh, that customer service actually can end up becoming a real different shader also in logistics in, um, in the next decade. Um, so uh, very, uh, very excited to uh, to be here, even though uh, Twill is not in the reform world yet, then uh, then uh, my heart will forever beat for uh, for for the coolest of uh, of, of coach of, uh, of, of uh, supply chains. Um, so um, we're definitely working on getting reefers uh, onto uh, the Twill platform as well within uh, within the near future. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, so if I may, um, I'd like to continue a conversation we were having kind of offline just before the session, uh, Genevieve, uh, when you were asking Andre some questions around real-time information. We've all said that real-time information, uh, we've been talking about this the last few years, hearing about it through the whole conference um, uh, so far, um, is uh, one of the foundational tools for uh, digitalization. Um, and obviously, smart reefers and smart containers and smart packaging, you know, there's a, a heap there. But Genevieve, you were asking Andre, um, and you might want to ask him direct, of course, <laughs> um, um, a, a, about availability of real-time information for shippers from the carriers. Um, so what happens is that I think there's two levels in there for me. So when I asked him the question, I was asking, what is the availability to the customer? Me, as, let's say I put my box into being secure in knowing that is coming from that reefer 
so that if there's any problem being given throughout, and that's why I also love what Andre was talking about, that it's not just about the reefer. We need what has happened in the, um, in the truck, which brought it to the reefer. Where did it go exactly? When it's in the reefer, what it is. And when it's left the reefer, I also want to be assured that the temperature is still gauged because when it gets to the buyer, if there has been some issues at any point, then I lose. So how do we mitigate this? Well, first of all, as I mentioned offline, I'm, I'm very honestly, I'm not a reefer expert. And, and Sophie, thank, thank you for being here because, because I know you can help me out. Um, but I think, you know, reefer, no reefer. The, the question is, you know, how do you, how do you share? I mean, sharing information is not that difficult. But what we've seen uh, across the years, and I'm sure it's been the same with, with Maersk and other carriers, is that you, know, you get a lot of data. The question is, what do you do with it? Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the short video, we, we've been working for some years um, on the, on the tri containers with Traxons. And I think they're also presenting at some point in, in Cool Logistics. And what we realized is that you know, customers are very keen on getting data. But in the end, uh, very often, they don't know what to do with it. So I think the question is not really um, what data can we get, it's, it's more about uh, how can it be presented to us in a way that brings you know, value to, to, to what we're trying to achieve. Um, and I won't say it again because people are fed up, but to do that you need to standardize and you need to agree um, with the other actors, not only the carriers, but also as you mentioned the ports, um, the trucks, uh, rail and terminals, etc on how you're going to uh, report that data, whether it's simply an event or it's data coming from you know, an IoT device. So, I, I, because I do believe that the manufacturer also needs to be part of that. So it's beyond that to so the manufacturers, because I think that what we've also, what I've also found through this journey is an IoT, IoT, IoT is so many different things. Is it an NFC with a, chip in it is an nfc without a chip what are you trying to measure how are you looking to prove the trust and i think that it be somehow that needs to be included mostly when we look at what has happened with the pandemic the issue wasn't the supply chain the issue was the logistical nightmare which were created by blockages and how do i then as a customer understand what I need to do or maintain. So one of the things that there is in the, what I learned in the last couple of years, there are certain temperature bands that have to be kept. And if those temperature bands are breached for 10 minutes versus two hours, it's going to be a difference. So how do we create those beacons also? So that's where the challenge is. But then the next challenge that I think we have is how do we create USB data. So really my data, I don't want Rachel to have to see it, but if both of us are in the same container, we should be able to get information for ourselves. Agree with you, giving me that information is really when there is a problem or creating the mechanism by which, and this is where we're going for, where we are presenting that information back. And that is the challenge. And but I don't want to, because if I just do it, but I never communicate to you, then there is something lost. And we are also then paying twice because you've got an IoT device that's measuring temperature. I've got a me uh, one which is on the package me measuring. And if there is a discrepancy, which one of us wins? Yes, yes, everything you say is true. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to have a chat with you, you know, offline. Yeah. I think it's not that I think it's not so simple. Uh, I think the information is there. We just need to figure out how to how to provide that information in, in a meaningful way, um, and also how to get that information from all the partners. We don't control, unfortunately, we don't control the full supply chain. So, uh, you know, there are some some external um, factors that we need to deal with. Is it, is it, sorry. I was going to say, I think this, you know, this is something we have talked about for quite a while, but um, uh, in, the, in the last while of conversation, I was thinking about Aunt Sophie when you first did come to Cool Logistics and talking about when Maersk turned on the uh, RCM 
uh, pipeline, if you like, and suddenly had all this data um, and had to go through that journey of what do we do with it? How do we manage it? How do we extract value from it uh, from the point of view of the carrier? Um, could I ask you, Anne-Sophie, and as you said, Twill isn't yet, yet, um, in reefers. Where is Twill kind of drawing all its data from? And, uh, you know, and how is it deriving value from it? What's the journey for you? Yeah, so you can say, um, I mean, maybe if, if uh, before I answer that question, if I can just uh, have one, one quick comment on, uh, on the, the discussion that just was, because so, the real time data, I think, is actually available today. It's 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 available through the MERS system. I'm sure it will be in the MSC system. I know it will be in the HAPAC system. That's one problem that is that it is different systems. Uh, Andre, I couldn't agree more with you that that is that is a, a problem for 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 the customers. Um, but 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 the data is there um there's a lot of things that i think everyone needs to sort out in terms of uh, who who owns the data i know in the merge systems today it is the the cargo owner who who decides you know who they want to share that data with and i think that's that's how it should be that can be done a lot easier you know in terms of digital you know engagement to allow you know whoever you want in your supply chain to to have that data uh, and i and i think that's not far away but what what my learning in this is and i think that's also a learning from twill is that the, the everything in this is about trust so in essence, then, then uh, today on on the most griefer system, for instance, of RCM, you actually there's no need to have data loggers anymore in uh, in 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 your your fresh products because you have the data uh, from from RCM or from Captain Peter. However, uh, I would say that that probably uh, a very large share of our customers are still spending the money on putting data loggers in their containers. Why is that? Well, it comes down to trust, right? And at, at, at the end of the day, this in, in this conference, we've for years been talking about the divide that somehow is between the cargo owners and, 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 and the shipping companies. And everything, when you talk about transparency and you talk about digital uh, engagement models and so on, trust becomes uh, psychologically an even more important element. So I think what, what one of the big tasks that we have ahead of us is actually maybe not so much anymore about figuring out how to make the data available in real time that's there, but how does the, the carriers, how do we start really building that trust that is needed for our customers to actually start using that data as their standard to monitor and, and, and control and handle their supply chains. And I think I think that that bit is probably um, just as complicated. It's a very different problem, but it's just as complicated to solve than uh, than the one of actually getting to where we are today in terms of of, of the data. Um, in Twill, um, so you can say Twill is as such connected to uh, to to Maersk in 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 a backend. So the the way to explain that is if you make a booking on Twill, then it is executed in the back uh, by by Maersk, but uh, Twill has its own front end, and it is a uh, model where we are trying to, uh, we call it, crack the code to digital sales and logistics. Uh, my big uh, aim in life is to uh, to prove that, of course, also in logistics, is online sales possible. Uh, uh, that there are sometimes people who are saying that that doesn't work work in logistics, but I think I I believe otherwise. So, and that means that the data is about how our customers are acting in terms of our uh, uh, how they interact with our website is uh, you know every second uh, we collect data on on their behavior and i do my very best to try to use that to learn from it and to fast make changes to uh, to the twill product uh, to try to serve uh, them better constantly so i say uh, data in terms of uh, how, how we use it in the operation that is exactly the same as how Maersk is uh, is handling their operation because Maersk is executing all of that what i sit with is how uh, the consumers are interacting in their buying uh, in the buying journey you can say of of their logistics if that makes sense so and Sophie, I have one challenge that I'd like to bring. I agree with you that um, the customer, the idea of the customer having a, a device in the reefer doesn't make sense. But there is, remember, between getting it from the truck into the reefer. Yeah. 
to other to other places, Maersk and other uh, carrier company to come up with what is the standard, and then commoditizing this to then allow people to go and buy. You know, this is a device that you use, and that device when it comes in connects to our system because we're part of the journey, we're not the whole journey. And I think that's where also there's a problem because they just put it in the reefer. <laughs> when it gets on that truck going from Miami to Washington, D.C., that's a loss. I think, if I may, we, no. I remember the, the yeah. first, oh, apologies, and the first ever cool logistics Genevieve, that we launched, um, which was before a lot of this technology was even on the market, it was 12 years ago, but shows you, you know technology movement we had this conversation this exact same conversation in our technology workshop how can we connect the dots between a sensor in a pallet or a load inside the container the device on the container so you know both the asset and the cargo are being um, monitored and protected um, with a handshake but recognizing that they have different needs um, I understand we had, a, and Andre, thank you. Uh, yeah, we had a, yesterday our uh, IoT panel with the different technology providers who are uh, looking to make containers smart and working on that journey with, with you, the carriers. Um, and um, yeah, that was a big topic of discussion. And it's coming, though. So it is definitely coming. And this is what we're proposing ourselves is to start with the NFC at the floor of the pro uh, production floor. And that information then can be shared across so that we, you know, we are putting in the device to test the temperature and humidity, but it's because I have to take it from a truck to the custom. It sits in custom and then gets loaded into maybe the reefer. So there are certain things which will go into one container, but if I don't have the possibility of putting in the container, itself so i think that we need that's why i think we need to shift the responsibility down to the manufacturer or producer itself and then have it work throughout to where you guys will and in this is where the whole data mess comes in because who owns that data is it the producer is it now because there's additional data that you're creating and that's where i think that distributed ledger technology has a role to play in that certain information will be shared across and certain information will retain. And we then have that trusted data and that journey. So if you as a manufacturer fail to put in the right device to start with, then you don't have as much rights when it's in the reefer and it's failing in the reefer. So you might get lucky if the carrier decides that this actually has been breached but that's also how we need to get the customer trust because customers now are saying mm, am i going to get what i need is it going to come to me and how do we um, manage those and for me i think that the take the, the digital transformation is there but the other key that i also should say and this is what we learned from haiti you don't need everybody with a smartphone you just need them to participate and provide the data that they themselves need and create that consensus across the way. So I, I think that this is, there is a great opportunity to actually look at how to mitigate those issues that we're having and those loss that we're having. Uh, thank you, uh, Genevieve. And um, this is truly to be a conversation we will continue. I've got a couple of questions in on the app, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so uh, if I may, I will pose them to you. So uh, this is in from John Trenchard, who's our top uh, performer on our leaderboard of activity and influence the last few days. Thank you, John, for this. So uh, John, uh, his point is, he says, Amazon are recruiting heavily in the logistics space with Amazon transport services, perhaps the next big thing. What do the panel think about this as an option for customers in simplifying their experience with a digital experience? I think that's one for Anne Sophie. I mean, you're the digital experience, Anne Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> so I, if I can, um, so I love the question, um, and I, I think I, um, so, so 
to me, you know, I think uh, the whole Amazon thing to me is uh, today uh, something about opportunity more than something to be afraid of. I think everything on transformation since the word uh, transformation and digital disruption really started, you know, 10, 15 years ago, right back then it was something we were scared of, right? We, we were told we had to change because otherwise, you know, the Amazons of the world would come and take away our business model. And I think, I think as the world is changing uh, much more, I think there's a, a lot more of us are seeing that, that we don't have to change because of a, a, a fear, uh, because of a burning platform. Actually, we have to change because of a burning desire for being able to create something that is truly exciting and that can create more value. And I think it is true that Amazon is moving into the space of logistics. I am personally of the opinion that there is plenty of room here for people to have have different solutions for uh, for different type of customers. I think there's a very interesting uh, coupling between logistics and the whole e-commerce logistics space, where all of a sudden you are actually playing, combining the B2B with the B2C space. I find that extremely interesting. It's something I'm looking uh, out for a lot because I could see, uh, that's not a secret, I could see Twill uh, wanting to, to explore that as well. Um, it is again all about trying to 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 move into a world where when you want to move goods that you make it as seamless as possible really from end to end and try to have much fewer of these hardcore handovers as January you you are also referring to which are really creating problems in 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 the cold chain today in the cold chain and in any supply chain today and um, so so to me uh, yes they are coming in I find it super interesting I'm watching it very closely uh, I'm not afraid of it I'm excited for it well we have another question in and um, I'm very pleased to see it from uh our uh, former colleague and great friend, uh, Alex von Stempel, and uh, with Asia Fruit Logistica. Um, and this is very topical in the light of recent events. Uh, how can we tackle the uh, security question? And I think Alex might mean particularly cyber security question in a digital shipping world. And obviously there've been some quite big incidents in uh, just recent times with a major shipping line. Um, and I think that cyber question extends not just to obviously shipping, but to all parts of the supply chain. Um, when you think about increased digital reliance um, of ports, um, well, every part of the supply chain, and even more so now in our COVID world where so many of us are working from home um, on multiple devices that may be uh, accessible in a way that, you know, uh, secure corporate systems haven't been, but even those have been hacked. So, yes, I'd love to get your views uh, all on the cybersecurity challenge. Uh, I, I mean, maybe a few words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew it was going to be me. Um, look, cyber cyber security is a um, is a topic which which you know concerns all of us, and. Um, I think that the you know the efforts we we did internally as many companies did is train the people, explain to people what it's all about, what are the risks, um, you know why you shouldn't click on an email from some you know gentleman uh, from any country that's offering you uh, two point five million dollars if you give him your bank account. I mean, these are things that you know we need to spread that word um, throughout uh, throughout our 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 uh, teams. Um, and if you look again at the, the younger generation, my daughter, for example, who's 25, um, she would never click. Um, but when you make, you know, when you do these in, internal tests, uh, the funny thing is that it's the people you wouldn't expect to click that actually click. So that's one, one aspect. I think it's informing the people and, and trying to, to, to make them understand what the risks are. Then, of course, the rest is about, you know, protecting your infrastructure as far as your internal systems are concerned or if you're using the cloud to um, you know try to choose solutions not there's many out there but um, but where security is uh, is um, obviously very very high up on the on the list uh, other than that what can i say you know when when they started when they built the first cars when you had an accident that was it and now if, if you have the same accident with a modern car you're you're, you're probably 
um, get out safe. So it, it's part of a process. It's part of a process. I, I, if there was a magic solution, I'd, um, you know, I'd probably be uh, calling uh, Bill Gates on his mobile. So. <laughs> But I can just say, I mean, I think, I think uh, the now definitely all the carriers, but I think many, many companies in the world uh, have, have, uh, but, but the carriers over the last years, uh, and, and it's well known that, that Musk is one of them, have kind of felt, you know, this uh, risk uh, very uh, closely uh, to our business. Um, I think uh, Elisa Musk, I agree to the training, right? That's very much what it's about, but it's also about investment. I think in Musk, we say that, that when we had our cyber attack uh, back in 2017, um, cybersecurity went from being a concern of the CIO uh, to be a concern of the CEO. And that means that this is now a top management uh, topic. It is something that is high on the agenda in terms of uh, hiring in professionals from other industries that that really, really, really know much more about it than, than what Merck is used to do. And it is on top of the agenda when we uh, choose vendors, uh, partners and so on and everything. So I can I can only say I think I think it's just changed the way we do our business, uh, the, the, the kind of priority it has and, 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 and our view on who we do business with. So, um, so it's uh, when you've been down, uh, down something like that once, then, uh, then you do everything you can to, uh, you can protect yourself from being attacked, but you can definitely protect yourself from the impact attacks can have. And how does this impact you, Genevieve? I mean, I've always been amazed that, uh, you know, a country like Haiti, as you described, is home to this World Bank project, uh, uh, taking a, uh, taking root and fruit, if you like, that's deploying some of the, you know, the most advanced uh, technologies, digital technologies. But, you know, so is cyber security, you know, a, an issue for the chain? I think that for myself, when I looked at this, that's also why I chose the platform that I did. So we went with the R3 platform. I didn't want to have for myself the burden, which is the same that I believe that Trade Lens is using. I didn't want to have the burden of security at the lowest level on, obviously we have created a very secure, the right le levels, layers in there to protect the data. But we also look at the data in two ways. The uh, right to write, it's a permission to be able to write versus being able to read. And what we're doing is the data that is collected is now being available through the observer nodes as uh, within an anonymized fashion. Or if you're not, if let's say the shipping company is part of it, the idea would be that the shipping company would be able to get for the shipment that they're receiving all the in, all the pertaining information that they need to have access to. So the security of the data, the USP of the individual, and what is very key to me in blockchain is allowing many people in the same industry to partake without having to worry that their data is going to be at risk from the wrong prying eyes. So um, you cannot design this without. Now, with the the piece that I love about this digital transformation for myself personally is that the people that we are affecting are actually we're not moving the curve very high for them in terms of digital. All we're asking is that they have a cell phone. So we need to think about digital that sometimes it is not about the equipment, but how you are streamlining the messaging because we are sending messaging to them when they receive information, when they receive money. And at the end of the day, I'm sure all of you in shipping, your customer doesn't really want, that's why they didn't want the data. They don't want to know throughout the whole journey all what's happening. They just want to know, did it get to point A and did it get from point A to point B? And once it's done that, fine. If there's any problem, tell me where the problem is so I can deal with it, but the rest of it, is more information that I need to. And I do not see not see the farmers really needing to go in the same way I know. I just want to know, is there money in my bank account? Is money missing? Has money been received? Beside that, I don't want to look at it on a daily basis. 
I think that's a, a great point. Thank you, uh, Genevieve. And maybe if the, uh, Andre could uh, uh, comment and, and Anne Sophie, we you've all mentioned the word value. You know, uh, what will it take to extract value from this mountain of data, these data lakes? Um, and I think that's a journey. But the, the industry is very. Uh, very much still on. So you'll have all this data coming in, Andre, for instance, from a, you know, a, a very large container fleet. That's a, a heck of a lot of, heck of a lot of data um, for your own team and uh, operationally and, uh, and customers. You know, what are your plans? You know, what other technologies need to be in place so you as a asset owner uh, and, and the service provider can extract value and, and likewise for your customers because I think what Genevieve is talking about is just tell me you know the the data points I need to know for who I am in the chain and really alert me if something's going wrong uh, exception management well I, I now have to look at my magic avocado to see if I have <laughs> but which is still hard by the way um, no, look. Um, you know, if I had to, if I had to, um, to 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 put it up in a user interface, I'd like to see um, a user interface where the customer can come in, um, choose what is important to them based on um, the mountain of data we have. And this is not only, you know, IoT on on containers. It's uh, it's about all the rest. You know, all, all all the rest of the information that people want to want to get. As a consumer, I'm interested only in the exceptions. But you know, in, in some cases, you need to, particularly on the reefers, you need to be able to look at the logs and, and see how the, the shipment has performed during the journey, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd really like to see a, um, uh, something simple where the customer can, or even the partner, in, in the case of, uh, of the whole chain, can go and select what makes sense for them. And I think you know, that's probably giving the opportunity uh, for, for everyone to, to select what has value for them. It's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, of course, if I brought in my data scientists, they would talk to you for three hours about uh, how they're going to do it for you, but we probably wouldn't understand the result. I've got some more questions coming in, in the app, on the app. Thank you, uh, dear audience. So if I may, I will, um, I will raise them up. Um, First one we have uh, here is um, from uh, Johannes uh, Nanninger with uh, Guangzhou Port Europe. Hello, Johannes. So Johannes says, in the title of this session um, is the word disruption. Uh, what do the panel see as the biggest candidates for disruption and what does it create? Gentlemen first. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, please, uh, I think it's just the, the disruption is really sometimes the alchemy that is created with the tools that we really already have at our disposal. So uh, disruption is also saying that the status quo will no longer continue to be. So we have um, in the last few months also gotten, I'd say, probably five to 10 years faster because we now could not move in the same way. You can't see the person against whom you're doing something. So the digital has been there for over 25 years. So digital identity has always been a part, but now we're starting to really see where it can be used and the acceptance. So the disruption to me is really how we are changing status quo to then allow through the use of technology to move us forward and start removing waste and creating better trust among all participants. Comments from Andre or Anne-Sophie on disruption? I mean, you yeah, well, I can, uh, I mean, I, I touched upon it a little bit before, right, that to me disruption is this uh, it's it's a little bit uh, maybe it's my uh, you know shipping ears that here it's negative uh, you know a tone word somehow that the, it's it's right it's this fear of someone coming in and disrupting our our industry so that we no longer have a a, a place to uh, uh, to or, or a reason to exist I think um, 
Uh, you know, if you'd asked me maybe uh, five years ago, ten years ago, I would have been less optimistic than I have today. But I, the speed that I'm seeing in terms of especially the container liners, uh, but also a large part of uh, both cold store providers, uh, ports, uh, as well as uh, freight forwarders, actually picking up new digital ways of working, new digital ways of providing transparency and value to our customers, uh, and and the many, many, many many initiatives that we see both from incumbent players as well as new players um in 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 the in in within the cool logistics especially um playing on everything from shelf life to uh, to security to uh, to transparency i'm extremely hopeful and i believe that um I, I believe that there are so many opportunities right now that 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 for everyone who wants to lean in and try to rethink your business model, not rethink it because you have to throw it out and not, and, and not play the same role anymore necessarily, not at all, but rethink about how you can actually use some of these new tools and new capabilities and how you can invest to, to make it core capabilities so you can really amplify the value you provide to your customers. I, th I, th I think to me, it actually, I'm excited and I think it holds a, a, a lot of value for, for, for the industry, not to mention the end consumers, which, uh, which, which I believe will be the ultimate winners in this. I think that was a perfect description. Disruption for me is a positive thing. Um, and I love disruption because, you know, if you don't disrupt, well, <laughs> you, you won't, we won't change. So, I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, and um, yeah, so you've said it all, I think, ladies. Well, um, that question and your answers lead perfectly into the next question, which is from our uh, moderator and speaker this morning and again this afternoon, Oleshak Pettersson. So Oleshak asks you, uh, the panel members, will it be the carriers or the logistics companies or a new entrant that will win the space for managing data flow uh, to and from all stakeholders in the supply chain? Well, if I if I can promote the, the Musk IBM initiative, I'd say that these kind of initiatives are the ones I think that will. I don't know if it's a win, but um, I think that you know the, the, the trade lens initiative, GSPN, and, and others, um, and we're only seeing the start. Is are probably the the ones that are going to provide uh, viable solutions by by creating those you know digital ecosystems where. Where, by the way, um, this you know still allows Twill, Twill to operate. For example, I, I see that um, very, very positively in that way. I don't think that the, I think the carriers have part of the data, and the other actors have another part of the data, and we've got to put that together. So I don't see, at least from MSC, I don't see ourselves as being the unique owners of the data and providing these services. That's not our core business. So I have a feeling that we need to sort of take a step back and sort of look at also open data principles. Um, and I think that right now we are, it's like the gushing of the oil that happened in, uh, in Texas in the early 20s. Uh, nobody really knew what you could do with all that oil and how to contain it and what the use would be. So obviously, uh, a large part of it will be the carriers uh, and the co logistic. But I think that there is a need to also start embracing those who, and many of us think more of the reefer, but there is a whole, even the small guy who has a small truck, which is taking it from A to B, whatever it is that may have, that needs to be tracked, that needs to be uh, kept in certain temperature, could be also in ways uh, the what makes the whole thing fail so that could be the failure point so i think that there is an opportunity for the logistic providers because they understand logistics and they breed and leave and live this to then be able to um lead in this space but there is also if not careful for an incumbent to come in because somebody like amazon People used to buy their books. You'd go and buy your books. You could also have something delivered. Delivery wasn't something new. You just had to go to many people to get. I wanted this. I had to put on. I had to call this person. Now I can do it in one place. So there is an opportunity to take the lead and to define. But then it needs to look to just not just 
the microcosm of that shipping industry, but every single part of the value chain to then, which is then bringing in. And this is where for me, I advocate the use of the distributed ledger technology to manage the data, which is incumbent for everyone because what's happening right now are people are doing this but you can't have it to where it's going to be your only silo very interesting also for me that amazon not only are they hiring but they're also putting in patents now for blockchain technology yes you if can i can see. just add to uh, to what's been said sorry then uh, ola thank you for the question i actually believe you have asked me this question before um i i actually think i'm uh, as as uh, our industry is changing a little bit i'm also changing my uh, my position on it uh, i think i have with a smile a few years ago answered this question and said that i of course had to say the carriers because i've been biased uh, you know i can't get around that <laughs> However, I actually have to say that what's happening in our industry um, over the last two or three years, I find extremely interesting because you're seeing for the first time for decades that all of a sudden the commoditization where everyone's running after more or less the same strategy is breaking. And all of a sudden now you have logistics providers who are splitting up with different strategies. You definitely have carriers who very loudly are saying that their view on, on where they want to go is, is, is differentiating. And, and that means that all of a sudden, I believe that, that there's not necessarily going to be, you know, this is not going to be a, uh, you know, one winner takes it all type uh, thing as what you would very often, or what we do very often see in, in the disrupted uh, B2C uh, industries, right? Whether it's Amazon or Uber or whatever, right? There's one big, uh, you know, platform that goes through and, and, and takes it all. I think it might be very different here because if these differentiated strategies of different players are actually playing through, then we will be speaking to different uh, elements or different parts of the markets and that the consumers, and I'm sure there will be consumers and customers for the different uh, opportunities. That's one. And number two, I really, really believe, and I, or I hope, that the answer isn't whether it is carriers or logistics providers or, or, or so on, but where we get to a point where it's actually a collaboration between the partners, because only when we get to a collaboration, uniform solutions, standards, as what Andre has been talking about, will we be able to really maximize the, the, the value for, uh, for, for our customers. And you see two carriers agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. I'm keeping an eye on our clock because I want to make sure uh, everybody could get into the networking room for chat and uh, uh, meetings and further discussion over over lunch. Um, but I've got a couple of uh, last questions come in, um, a couple of quite practical ones, but I think it's important to, you know, if we've been talking at quite a high level, to raise them. So question here from um, Gerald. Uh, Fori with Dole South Africa. Thank you, Gerard, for the question. Um, I'd like to have the panel's view on when the industry could expect live container tracing and tracking. Current tracking tools on shipping line websites are found to be rather reactive versus being a proactive uh, managing tool. Uh, managing items such as demurrage and detention, container transshipment delays and so on. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, we, I mean, I, I think that, you know, when we, we spoke to, we speak to customers regularly and I think what they're interested in is exceptions rather than, um, uh, it's exceptions and, you know, proactivity in, if there is a disruption in, in the, uh, in the transport, uh, rather than having, you know, being able to pinpoint where the container is. Um, it's very easy to do that actually. And now, of course, you know, when you equip containers, uh, dry or reefers with, with, with IoT and modems, um, you can do that. The question is, you know, is that useful? Um, and in, in my view, the, what we need to do is to work on the exception management. We need to work on being able to react when there is something that, that goes uh, wrong rather than, you know, being able to play back like you would on an airline, uh, in some of the airline tools. Uh, and see, you know, where the flight is, um, has been. 
And I think this goes back to the uh, what conversations we've been having earlier here, that particularly with the pandemic that caused such you know disruption to um, container flows and location and schedules and positioning, that it is about you know the uh, you know the, the shipper, the cargo owner wanting to have you know as much uh, advance warning as possible that something is not going to plan, so they can you know, manage their own and mitigate their own uh, supply chain risk. And every event we've done has been about those vis shippers calling for those visibility tools to give them the proactive power um, to uh, uh, to make a decision that can avoid their supply chain breakdowns. Yeah, predictability. Uh, and now more than ever. Yeah, we, have, we have to move. Yeah, and we have to move from, I mean, we also talked about that before, right, that, that we have to move from transparency, right, uh, to, to predictability. I mean, we, we have to kind of move the needle uh, in, in, in how we use that data. But actually, if I can stay to this point, I actually also believe this is very tied up to customer service. Um, so customer service, is, it sounds like that it needs to be only a human being. I don't think that's true at all. I think it's it's about really good track and trace, uh, proper event reporting, you know, that, that is something that is, that is uh, providing you with the information, the right information that you need at the right time, right? And I think, I mean, I can speak for most, that's not a secret. For instance, you know, we have this thing called ETA notifications, right, where we will bombard our customers about when a ship arrives. If you really think about what a customer wants, right? Who cares when a ship arrives, right? I mean, that's 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 not interesting at all, right? You want to know when you can pick up your container, and um, so so you know some of these things that that where this is what I'm when I'm talking about becoming more customer centric in the way we try to design the entire customer experience. There, this customer service element needs to become, I hope, for really for our industry that it starts becoming something we start investing in from a digital angle in terms of how you use digital tools to provide information but also you know on the other hand i also believe in human touch think about amazon right there you also have someone you can call and someone who who helps you out and they turn a bad a bad experience into a really good lasting good experience very quickly and so i hope that 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 the whole logistics industry will will get to a point over the coming years where we actually start investing in this again i i believe it's a trend that i'm seeing so um, so i'm hopeful do you have any comments on that andre no i completely agree i completely agree so this uh, is Yes, uh, uh, data for exception management as a customer service and customer value. Um, very interesting. Um, we're getting close to uh, the uh, end of the session, but I just wanted to pick up on something, and apologies, I didn't do this earlier, Andre, that was in your uh, video presentation as one of the um, uh, you know, digital technologies um, c coming into the market now. And I think that does go back also to uh, uh, customer service, actually, is it the e-bill of lading. Um, bill of lading being one of the oldest sh shipping documents in the world um, and um, one of the uh, uh, most important. So could you say a little bit more to the audience about what's happening with e-bill e of lading? Um, well, to be very honest, I remember probably 20 or 25 years ago, I got a call from a company that still exists in a different form saying, you know, we have an e-bill of lading. I said, great, let's talk about it. Um, and then nothing happened for the next 20 odd years. Um, you know, the, again, the bill of lading is, um, it's, of course, it's a very important document for all of us. We see it as, you know, the, the sort of holy grail of documents. Uh, for many reasons, also because it's a business model to some you know, parts of the, of the industry. Um, and yet it's very simple to, to, to change that and to, um, to, to get rid of the, the actual paper and then the sending of the paper. But to do that, you need to use some of the technologies that are available today, um, such as the blockchain, which everybody loves. Um, and, you know, there's a good example of how you can use those technologies to make sure that the, the document is that is issued is, is a real document and then it's passed on to the different parties and endorsed and, and, and what have you. Um, but again, to get to that point, um, I mean, you can either say, well, you know, there's going to be 20 different providers out there who do it and that's fine. 
but that's going to be tough for some parts of the of the business to be able to deal, to, to deal with it. Um, or you can say, well, you know, here's a standard, and I was referring to to one of the recent projects at DCSA, where the first thing is to say, well, what's in a bill of lading? You know, what are the fields? What are the data elements? Um, how do we codify them? And then once you have that, you can start to look at solutions to to secure that information and. and I mean, we we're participating in, in a startup uh, as as is Maersk actually the same one, um, and there's many other companies out there providing the services. And I again go back to the same story. If we want to make sense of that, then they they have to we have to find interoperability one way or another. Well, we have another question coming through on the platform, and uh, with uh, just uh, five minutes to go, I think it's the. Um, Perfect question to close with. Uh, I was going to ask something similar myself, but I'm going to turn the floor to our uh, audience. It's from, um, hello, uh, Mikhail Lind um, at uh, RSE. And uh, so here's the question. So if we move forward 10 years, please put yourself 10 years in the future, what would you look back on that was the big breakthrough, uh, the tipping points uh, in the value being brought to the transport industry um, by digitalization? Ladies, please. I'm not in transport. <laughs> well, I think the question applies generally, you know, in terms of what you're doing, like 10 years from now, you know, what do you think you'll be looking back on and going, that made a difference? Actually, I think that uh, one of the uh, issues that when we look at the producer, be it a farmer or an artist, being given a fair share and through our trust system, creating these long value chains where you have intermediaries who do not have any role to play. Through the advent of technology, we now can remove some of those intermediaries. It doesn't mean that you still don't need somebody for the transportation, for the networking, all those things, but there are too many who are then bleeding up value. So it's really being able to get to a form of um, straight through processing in the value chain that then removes uh, all the waste. And which means for us as customers, having a price which is much more fair to what is being the, dis the overall distribution and having that transparency in cost. Uh, Michael, please feel free to give me a buzz and, and we can talk about it. I think one word for me, it's simplification. If we can, if we can get simplification and as, you know, and Sophie was obviously advocating, that's the goal of, 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 of you know, solutions like Twill. Um, and, you know, whether that needs to, that's what needs to happen in my opinion, simplification. Then what technology we use, you know, that's a, that's a different story. But if we can simplify and we can look back and say, damn, we simplified these processes. We made things this more efficient. We, and as Geneviève was saying, obviously uh, uh, favoring the, the producers is a very important uh, topic where we have less, let's say, say, but I think simplification. It's supposed to be one word. I mean, I can I can try to end just with my view. I think I have uh, I have three things that they haven't happened yet, but I hope they happen soon. And then I believe that they will be big uh, big marks to think back of. Number one is um, is when the entire industry start actually competing on customer experience. I think the day that that actually becomes a competing uh, arena, I think that that will be a massive milestone. I think the digitization of the document flow, the e-bill we just talked about, that is a, it's a, it will be a game changer of our industry. And lastly, something that I know has been spoken about a little bit, uh, maybe yesterday, um, it's about capability and, and diversity of capability and adapting learning mindsets in, in, in our industry. So this thing about figuring out how we go from, I don't even believe that, that shipping today have a very high uh, one dimensional uh, uh, diversity, meaning you know that we're not very diverse in terms of uh, gender, nationality, so on, so on. But when we get to two dimensions, dimensional where where you you mirror both uh, that inherit the diversity with also with capabilities that is really where you start being able to uh, to push 
uh, your organizations faster, especially when it gets to innovation. And that is what this industry direly needs. So I believe that, that, that when these three things start becoming real, start becoming true topics in our industry, that's something I will in 10 years uh, from now think back of as seeing as uh, something that pushed us forward. Well, thank you very much. Uh, wonderful discussion, uh, very diverse and much appreciated. Uh, Andres, a small closing point, simplification. There's a quote that springs to mind, which is, uh, I'm looking for the simplicity that lies on the other side of complexity. Um, so, um, <coughs> very nice. Yeah get there i think then um well we're bang on time for finishing and i just want to um thank you all uh, andre uh, genevieve for fantastic presentations and sophie for joining us i'm taking away a lot of thoughts and positivity on the journey ahead um and uh the journey towards value and uh, deploying these technologies so uh, thank you again and uh, thank you audience for taking part and for all your questions we close this session now and uh, we are opening our lunch networking room i believe in uh, 15 minutes at 1 30 so please come and join us uh, continue the conversation and um, we will look forward to uh, seeing you uh, in the next session um annalise do you have any closing points for us uh, I don't, but uh, just to remind everyone, as Rachel said, uh, Helen will be expertly hosting lunch. It was a great session yesterday, um, really interactive. I would genuinely encourage everybody to go along, put your cameras on, have a chat, um, yep. share your sandwich or whatever it is that you're having, interact. Let's let's keep that conversation going. <laughs> and have another card, right? Have avocado. <laughs> <laughs> and the next session, as Rachel says, uh, we start uh, lunch starts in fifteen minutes. The session this afternoon starts at two thirty. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.